Good evening from the News Radio 1120 AM and 93.7 FM KPNW Studios. I'm Georg London. You can hear me on the wake up call 6 a.m. to 9 on KPNW on the radio or streaming at KPNW.com. And this look at the news is brought to you by Dr. Michael Bratland. Not just Dr. Michael Bratland, Dr. Michael Bratland of Chris Dental, where if you call him today, they can see you today. He's the only dentist I know that actually gives you his cell number, which is kind of awesome if you think about it. Anyway, and by the way, I'm noticing, I think my hair yarmulke needs to be depilled. I don't know what the deal is. Anyway, all right, here's a look at some of the stories that we're following. Well, the U.S. national debt has now surpassed $34 million for the first time. That according to newly released data from the Treasury Department, the total public debt outstanding reached $34.001 trillion last Friday, just three months after first crossing the $33 trillion mark. That's a lot of debt really fast. The latest milestone for the national debt, of course, comes as Congress is facing more spending deadlines as it returns here in the new year after narrowly averting a government shutdown twice last fall. The growing debt pile has repeatedly been a source of tension in recent battles over government funding, including last spring's standoff over the borrowing limit. While President Biden and House Republicans finally reached a deal raising the debt limit just days before the U.S. was set to default, Fitch ratings downgraded the country's credit rating from AAA to AA plus in August. The rating agency cited the U.S. is increasing debt burden, and I'll just quote the decision by Fitch. This is what they wrote. In Fitch's view, there has been a steady deterioration in standards of governance over the last 20 years, including on fiscal and debt matters. Oh, well, that, that, uh, that ought to make you feel real good. So this is a story that really hasn't gotten as much attention as you think it should. Police in Medford, Oregon, and the Asante, <clears throat> pardon me, the Asante Rogue Regional Medical Center in Medford are being very mum surrounding a series of deaths and severe infections at the hospital that happened in mid to late December after a nurse allegedly stole fentanyl from IV bags and replaced it with tap water, which caused these deadly infections. Now, authorities in Medford, and I'm talking about the police, will only confirm they're investigating one death, although the families of other victims have come forward saying that their relatives were killed too. Now, some sources within the hospital claim nine people died. Multiple hospital sources who are obviously not wanting to lose their jobs and decline to be identified confirmed that dozens of patients were injured by what's called medication diversion. That's replacing actual drugs with another substance, in this case, again, tap water. A family member of one of the victims, Garrett Atwood, says when he was told his 36-year-old brother, Samuel Allison, had died from an infection, Asante officials informed him that his brother's pain meds had been tampered with. Atwood further claimed that hospital affection, uh, officials said the infection was developed directly linked to the tap water that the nurse in question was replacing it with. Now further, Atwood said the hospital officials told him the employee was no longer working in the medical field as they were reported to both the medical board and police. Now at this point, other reports claim the nurse in question was in an ICU unit. The deaths and infections are said to be caused by what's called pseudonymus, which is present in tap water and also dirt. The CDC says pseudonymus can spread to people in healthcare settings who 
were exposed to contaminated wa water or soil. They say those most risk at infection includes those on breathing machi machines, catheters, and those with surgery or burn wounds. Now, this whole issue apparently is also compounded by another issue, which is the water supplies in the intensive care unit and the coronary care unit, which are in an older part of the hospital, are apparently unsafe for use on patients, even for face washing, according to insiders, which makes this all even more disturbing. Now, the hospital made numerous public statements during 2023 pertaining to infections and actual water quality issues. At this point, though, in regards to the deaths and the multiple infections, no one is saying anything, and it's not known if or when anyone will. Also, another doctor from Medford has suggested because of the nature of the crimes that dealing with controlled substances and if that many deaths are a part of this, that the FBI could even potentially be involved. <coughs> I've got a frog in my throat tonight. Attorneys for former President Donald Trump filed a 162-page brief with the Oregon Supreme Court arguing that efforts to block him from the state's ballot, which is being led now by Portland lawyers Dan Meek and Jason Kafori, are inappropriate. If you recall, these same two went to the Secretary of State, Lamont griffin Vallad, uh, earlier in December or late November, saying that Trump should be excluded. She said that she couldn't keep him out of the primary, so these two lawyers have decided they're going to take it to the Oregon Supreme Court. Now, if you recall, the top court in Colorado, and also just a couple of days ago, Maine's Secretary of State, agreed that Trump's role in January 6th of 2021 was a coup attempt violating the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, disqualifying him from the ballot in those states. But Trump's attorneys argue in their filing that the argument is incorrect. They say, and I'm quoting, President Trump simply didn't violate Section 3. They write, the events of January 6th included serious crimes and violence by others, but they did not amount to insurrection within the meaning of the 14th Amendment. By the way, it should be noted that President Trump has never been found guilty of insurrection. Todd Sprague, a spokesman for the Oregon Judicial Department, said the court has asked both parties to submit supplemental briefs by January 9th and that they will render a decision sometime after that. While a Harney County judge Tuesday denied each of Oregon's objections to his findings that helped him form his opinion that Oregon's voter-approved gun control measure 114 violates the Oregon Constitution's right to bear arms, Circuit Judge Robert Rascio held a hearing by video to allow the state's lawyers, lawyers from the Department of Justice under Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum, to make their arguments and then he systematically rejected their challenges. Rascio is now going to sign a final order that strikes down Measure 114, which the state has already said it will appeal to the Oregon Court of Appeals. That measure passed, as you, if you recall, back in November of 2022. Now, it requires that you go through a bunch of classes that don't exist, including live fire training, then an FBI background check, to buy or to then purchase a gun permit that would allow you to buy a gun that would require you to go through another background check. It also bans the possession, sale, transfer, and manufacture of magazines that hold more than 10 rounds of ammo. Oregon Special Assistant Attorney General Harry Wilson told Rascio the state is going ahead with plans to budget money and buy fingerprint scanners should the appeals court overturn his ruling and allow the regulations to take effect. Wilson said while Rascio's ruling bars the state from enacting or enforcing Measure 114, he says it shouldn't prevent the state from engaging in ordinary work 
in the meantime to support the regulations. Meanwhile, the attorney Tony Aiello, who represented a pair of Harney County gun owners and successfully fought the measure in front of Rascio, said the state's actions amount to a waste of taxpayer money. The judge said he wasn't going to rule beyond finding that the measure and all of its applications are facially unconstitutional under Article 1, Section 27 of the Oregon Constitution. Despite a number of objections by the state, for several of the judge's factual findings in the opinion, the judge stood by his ruling that the permitting process could delay a gun purchase for a minimum of 30 days, even though the measure says the permit shall be issued within 30 days, should no problems arise during a background check, even though the law says that you are supposed to get your gun within or can get your gun within three days if the state, for whatever reason, holds up your background check when you're filling out your forms right now to purchase a gun. Rascio further stood by his finding that the state failed to present evidence that the measure would improve prove public safety, reiterating that the number of mass shootings in this country is statistically insignificant. The judge also rebuffed the state's objections to his conclusion that gun magazines are a necessary component of a firearm. Now, the state has said that magazines, which hold the ammunition, that go into the gun and feed the ammunition into the gun, they say that those are accessories that they aren't required for the gun to function. And as proof, what did they use? Muskets. So the judge said, no, I'm not buying that. He also rebuffed the state's objections that the media sensationalizes mass shootings. Oh, the media doesn't do that. Oregon Governor Tina Kotek seems to be supporting the federal government's plan to further study the impacts of the Snake River dams, if you read between the lines, before any congressional consideration of dam breach, according to her office. Now, Anka Matica is Kotex press secretary, and she says, quote, the governor, uh, the governor is supportive of the United States government's commitment to study the transport of goods and assess prudent, cost-efficient alternatives that do not put an economic burden on river users or ratepayers and provide the information to Congress prior to any congressional consideration of dam breach. Now, here's the thing. The federal government actually the Biden administration, recently announced a proposed initiative with plaintiffs in a long-running lawsuit over Snake River's dams that are run, of course, by the Army Corps of Engineers and overseen by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA Marine Fisheries. Besides that, along uh, several tribes were a part of this, and other plaintiffs who are essentially a who's who of radical environmentalist groups like Sierra Club, Idaho Rivers United, the Columbia River Keepers, the National Wildlife Federation, the Idaho Conservation League, and the list goes on and on and on. The agreement was already made, and now the idea is Congress is supposed to fall in line. Now, the governor's press secretary also said the state of Oregon agrees that action is needed within just a few fish generations. Now, of course, in this case, the state of Oregon really is Democratic leadership in Salem, who are typically anti-business, anti-big agriculture, and they don't really care about ratepayers and how much you're paying for your electricity. Because if you use electricity and you sit in your house cold, well, that's keeping the world safe from greenhouse gases. District Judge, um, at this point, it's up to Congress to finally sign off on it. The question is, will they? And the answer to that is probably not. All right, well, this look at the news brought to you by Dr. Michael Bratland the big guy at Chris Dental. And he has a wonderful staff, by the way. You can tell when you go in. He's my dentist. You can tell when you go in that he spends a lot of time in the hiring process. His hygienists are absolutely awesome and a great office staff. All right, I'm done. This look at the news again, brought to you by Doc Ratland. It is now time for Rick 
to roll out some sort of iteration of real 